All right, let's begin. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the SCOW quarterly meeting. Uh, for those of you who may be unfamiliar with the SCOW, SCOW stands for the State Epidemiologic Outcomes Work Group and comprises researchers, epidemiologists, data managers, and other professionals involved in research and data collection and utilization pertaining to underage drinking and substance use. Uh, my name is Connie Emery, and I'm a part of the UH Epi team, um, along with Bobby Doe and Dr. Victoria Fan, and also Nicole Siegel. For the SCOW, we produce the Hawaii State Epidemiologic Profile for alcohol and drugs using the latest available data from diverse data sources to profile the current substance use situation locally. Uh, in addition, we conduct quarterly meetings where individuals and organizations have the opportunity to share their substance use related data. And the SCOW also provides technical assistance and training for state and community stakeholders. Okay, so we have our agenda posted here on the screen. So to quickly go over our agenda, we will be having two presentations today. Our speakers are Sean Okamoto and Dr. Alvin Bronstein. Um, in between these two presentations, however, we will have a five minute break. And then at the very end, we're going to close the webinar with um, talking briefly about the SCOW membership and consent form. All right, so this will be the first time that we are having uh, the SCOW quarterly meeting using the webinar format on um, Zoom. So please bear with us if there are any technical difficulties or problems that occur. If you have any questions or comments during the presentations, please send them through the chat as we will have time after each presentation to answer questions, comments, and feedback. So after each presentation, we'll have about 10 to 15 minutes for questions. All right, I think that's all for the opening. So we will get right to it. Our first speaker is Sean Okamoto, who is the program coordinator for the UH Manoa Telecommunications and Social Informatics Program, also known as TAZI, at the Pacific Health Informatics Data Center, also known as FIDIC. And he will be presenting an overview of the All Peer Claims Database. So please join me in welcoming Sean. Thanks, Connie. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen. All right, um, thanks for having me. So, so today I'm just going to go over uh, a quick overview of the, the all pair claims database. I'll give a little bit of background um, and then also talk a little bit where, where the Hawaii all pair claims database is, kind of what data we're collecting, how that kind of intersects a little bit with some substance use disorder data. Um, and then also talk about some of the next steps and upcoming projects that we're gonna be working on in collaboration with our partners at MedQuest. Um, okay, uh, so basically I just want to give a background really quick, um, just, just if you're not familiar. So all pair claims databases are large scale databases that collect data derived from eligibility files, medical claims, pharmacy claims, dental claims, provider information. Um, in many states they're uh, initiated via legislative mandates, other states have them as voluntary efforts. Um, in the state of Hawaii, we actually do have a le le legislative mandate to collect some of this data for our APC, which, which I'll go through a little bit later. Um, so just from a national perspective, we're one of about 19 or 20 states in implementation for an all pair claims database, the earliest one starting in the early to mid 2000s. So some are very old um, and then some are also very new. Um, we're kind of in the, in the middle in, in, in the middle of our implementation, uh, we're kind of in the middle uh, in terms of progress in terms of the entire country. Um, but we also see more and more states kind of um, jumping on and, and trying to create these uh, paired claims databases for their state agencies um, and to, to do additional research and, and studies on certain types of data. Um, and in general, um, you know, globally, we, we view the value for all, all paired claims data in these kind of ways. Um, you know, looking and understanding better our healthcare costs and expenditures in our state, um, trying to increase the transparency of data that were, is available to the community, to agencies, to legislators, um, 
using the data kind of as a tool for measurement of some key metrics for our communities, um, seeing if we can measure and impact changes in the health system, and also using the data to see if we can drive policy and other healthcare improvement initiatives. Okay, so I'm gonna go through really quickly a little bit of what kind of where we are with our Hawaii APC, what kind of data that we collect um, and things like that. So let me go through that. So our Hawaii APCD is a partnership between the State Health Planning and Development Agency, SHIPTA, um, and the State of Hawaii MedQuest Division, so the Medicaid Agency, um, and then us at the University of Hawaii at Tati Medic. Um, through legislation, we're authorized to collect uh, Medicaid data, data from the Employee Union Health Benefits Trust Fund and its plan, so that's all of the um, state and county employees, dependents, and retirees. Um, we collect Medicare fee-for-service data directly from CMS. Um, and then recently, we also got authority to collect Medicare Advantage data. Uh, we haven't started that initiate, initiating that collection yet, though. Um, and currently, we have data from EBTF, all of the plans. So that includes data from HMSA, Kaiser, VSP, HDS, CVS. Um, and we have uh, also data pulls from Medicare for their fee-for-service claims data as well. Um, and I just want to touch on, so, so most of our data collection from EUTF and the health plan themselves uh, comes in the format we specify in our data submission guide. And what that does is just specifies kind of the nature of the data that we collect, um, what we expect the data to look like, uh, what are the rules around that data, um, and how we, how we actually want to, uh, quality, to do our quality assurance processes to make sure the data that we uh, collect is up to our standards. So all of that's included in our data submission guide for the plans to use. Um, and this is the basis for us to, uh, for, to collect all of the data for the APCD. Um, and then in general, um, some of the information that we collect through, the, through our uh, collection processes are subscriber and member information, including demographic information, um, information about the health plan, uh, diagnosis codes, service and procedure codes, facility information, provider information, dates of service. Um, and I think what differentiates an APC from some other data sources is the ability to get also paid amounts on some of the chart, uh, on, some, uh, on the healthcare claims, not just charges. Uh, we also collect uh, patient responsibility amounts, so co-pays, co-insurance, deductible information, um, and also secondary and tertiary payment information from other payers. Um, and just briefly, uh, we have a, a few project authorities. So Act 139 authorized SIFTA uh, to allow them to get, give the mandate to collect some of this information specifically from Medicare, MedQuest, and UTF. Uh, we have interim, interim administrative rules that kind of govern the activities. Um, and then recently in, in 2018, we passed an Act, Act 55 was passed, which established the Health Analytics Office in MedQuest. Um, and kind of further a partnership with MedQuest to further our activities with the APCD. Um, and in general, these are, these are some um, highlights from our interim rules. Our goals here are to kind of use the data to enable studies on, on different types of activities, right? Cost and quality of care, uh, population health, health disparity, increasing transparency, um, health planning, public policy, um, and when we originally started, a, a big push was in the transparency space specific to the federal government and CMS. So that's still part of our, our vision as well. And then kind of just reiterating that globally, these are our multi-year analytic objectives. I won't go through them. Um, they're fairly similar to what we talked about before, but again, looking at costs, looking at quality, disparities, population health, chronic condition management, those types of things, waste fraud and abuse studies. Um, and just quickly, um, so we, from, a, from the ETF side, um, this is kind of where we are in terms of our data collection. Sorry, it's a little wordy, but I'll go through it pretty quick. Um, so basically from ETF, we have data from 2009 to quarter three of this year. So we're actually fully caught up with ETF in terms of our, our production submission schedule. Um, CBS is the same way um, as is HDS. Uh, we're working with Kaiser to review some of the quality reports. So Kaiser has also has submitted some production data to us. We're in the process of doing our QA process with them to make sure that those data products uh, meet our standards. 
Um, and then once those processes um, complete, uh, we're able to establish the quarterly submission process with Kaiser as well. Um, HMSA, we're caught up with HMSA on their quarterly data submissions to the APCD. Um, VSP is kind of in the same boat as Kaiser. They've submitted production data to us. Uh, we're working with them to review their quality reports and collect some of the remaining historical data that's outstanding. Um, and then lastly, uh, our Medicare fee-for-service data, which we get directly from CMS. We, we have data through 2014, which is quite old. Uh, we did submit a request for an additional data pool. Um, right now, it's kind of in CMS's hands pending their final approval. And then once we do that, we'll, we'll get another tranche and pull of the Medicare data as well. Um, and then I just wanted to quickly just touch on APCDs and, and substance use disorder data. Um, I think that'll be most relevant for the folks here. Um, so generally APCDs, uh, the main intersection is through 42 CFR part two. So there's been some issue with certain APCDs or APCDs in general collecting uh, substance use disorder data just because of the protections put on by 42 CFR part two for those federally funded programs uh, for substance abuse disorder program. Um, so previously in 2014 and 2017 uh, through that final rule, uh, they specified that disclosures could be made for research purposes to entities who are HIPAA covered entities, business associates, or if they're subject to the common rule. Um, the APCD Council and the National Association of Data Organizations, um, they put comments in about issues with that because a lot of the APCDs are actually run by state agencies, so they're not really covered entities and they're not subject to common rule um, restrictions or conditions. Um, so they wanted the they wanted SAMHSA to update kind of the regulation to make sure that's more flexible for those scenarios, specifically for APCDs. Um, so very recently, 2020, um, SAMHSA has updated their final rule for 42 CFR Part 2. So now they're allowing, um, they're aligning more of their uh, release requirements with HIPAA. So they're allowing disclosures by lawful holders who are HIPAA covered entities or business associates to individuals or organizations who are not HIPAA covered entities or subject to the common rule, as long as they meet the condi specific conditions. And a lot of those are in alignment with the HIPAA privacy rule. So as long as they're abiding by the HIPAA privacy rule, they can make some of those uh, releases of data now. And then just how this affects the Hawaii BC. So previous to this, you know, we have not collected any data, any sub data that falls under 42 CFR part two protection. Um, we have, we do have some substance use disorder data uh, but those are the non-federally funded programs. Um, so it's very small compared to the, I think there's a larger, the, the larger uh, scope of the data. Um, and, you know, once the final rule gets into effect, uh, I think one of the things that we wanted to look at is the, is if that allows us to collect additional data that we didn't have access to trees previously. So we'll work with our data submitters uh, if that's the case um, so that we can get all the data that we're, we're able to get for, for research purposes. Um, and, and I just wanted to touch on too. So CMS also changed the rules for, uh, after the 2017 final rule. So pre 2017 CMS was really, was in their Medicare data was redacting all of the SUD data um, out of their data distributions to states, um, specifically in the research identifiable files. Um, but after that final rule was effective, they stopped that redaction. So the old data pool that I was talking about before for our Medicare data, we, we actually did not have any sub data in that data set, um, but this new one that we're asking will actually include some sub data that we previously didn't have access to. And then I just want to touch on this a little bit. So because we're dealing with claims, uh, the way that we'd, ident we'd identify substance use disorder data is either through diagnosis code or procedure code. So this is an example of how CMS uh, distributes some of their data in the Medicare files. So they actually put um, these uh, chronic condition flags basically uh, on certain individuals if they meet certain criteria. So for example, if you look here for the alcohol use disorders, uh, it's basically by diagnosis code. So either ICD-9 ICD if it's pre-2015 or after 2015 it's ICD-10 um, and then various procedure codes. And then based on that um, and the look back period, uh, they'll put someone in the inclusion or exclusion criteria based for determination if they, they are considered to have a alcohol use disorder, at least in, in CMS's perspective.
Um, and then I'll just touch a little bit about like use cases from other states that we've seen. Um, most of them focus on opioids that you'll see. Uh, so this one study was from uh, the Minnesota Department of Health who runs the Minnesota All Care Claims Database. Uh, so they looked at a prescription trend in different age groups, um, comparing the year 2012 and 2015. Um, so you can see, I think across the board in their age groups, they saw the opioid prescriptions go down between those three years, um, as long as well as the overall kind of total average. Um, and then this one is from Civic, so that's the Colorado All Payer Claims Database. Uh, they specifically did a study on oxycodone, Percocet, and Vicodin prescription trends throughout the life of the APCD, so that, that they had data from 2009 to 2017. This, this showed trends in, in those prescription trends, and this is, I think, per 1,000 eligible members. Um, and then this is just um, uh, another one from Colorado APC where they looked at emergency department use specific to mental health uh, reasons, either depressive disorder, I think also some substance abuse as well. Um, and I'll briefly touch about some of the, the challenges that I think that we are, are facing with our APCD and kind of some next steps that we're looking towards. Um, so one of the big ones, you know, is the, is the changing healthcare landscape, specifically in the areas of the non-fee-for-service payments. Um, so our APCD, because we collect claims information, a lot of that information is collecting, you know, fee-for-service payments. Um, but, but we're seeing kind of a lot of uh, providers, insurance companies specifically, you know, in primary care and other, other areas as well, uh, moving to more value-based payments. So that's one of the things on our radar about thinking about how we want to collect value-based payments in the future. Um, another thing uh, we've, we're consistently working on is, is our data quality, right? Um, so because we're getting data from multiple data sources, all the health plans, UTF, Medicaid, Medicare, uh, they all have uh, data challenges in, a, in, a, in and of it themselves. Um, and putting the, putting the data together and in a way that makes sense and the data is valid um, has been a challenge, but we're working through that. So we worked really closely with all of the health plans to make sure that their data is up to a certain standard as well as with ETF. Uh, we're also con constantly working with Medicaid on that. Um, and with Medicare, you know, the challenge with Medicare is, is the data is the data, right? We get the data directly from CMS. And there are some discrepancies in that data, but there's limits to, to kind of how we, we can get CMS to make some of those changes. Um, and then lastly, um, Go Bay versus Liberty Mutual. So uh, we are not able to mandate any data collection to a uh, self-insured um, employer group, at least covered lives that we're not able to access. We are able to collect that data on a voluntary basis from those entities. We're just not able to mandate them at this time due to the Supreme Court decision on that. Yeah, so I'll just touch, I think this is my last section. I'll, I'll just briefly touch about some current work and future work that we're doing with mentors and kind of uh, where do we, where we're going from here? Um, so, so current to a lot of our work that I just talked about with PC, you know, in working with Quest, um, you know, they recognize they need to invest in analytics to support uh, their growing needs to support their program improvement, operations, healthcare, et cetera. Um, and, you know, the NAC is about a relationship and partnership with them. Um, so right now we're working with MedQuest to plan and implement an analytic platform um, and establish data governance processes to further both the Hawaii BCD and evolving MedQuest needs. Um, and because this is a, a Medicaid project, uh, we're leveraging federal matching dollars here to support the implementation and future maintenance of this platform. And this kind of builds upon kind of what we've developed and built for the APCD in terms of our expertise, our infrastructure, and left. Um, and just to note, so we've submitted for this work with MedQuest um, funding requests with CMS, um, and our activities kind of are, are contingent on, on CMS giving us that approval to, to move forward. Yeah, so for next year, you know, uh, we envision us uh, initiating our platform procurement and implementation for that new analytics platform, also initiating a bunch of our data governance processes work. 
also establishing rules about data access, data release processes, et cetera. And we'd, we'd also like to kind of clean up and finish up our historical data collection specifically from UTF and the health plan. Um, so most of our submitters are up to schedule. We have a few that are not quite there yet. Um, we also would like to kind of complete our new Medicaid data pool uh, request process, making sure that we get the most updated data we can for Medicare into our system. Um, and then with Medicaid, you know, initiate that Medicaid data, data collection, do our quality assurance work and integrate their data with the rest of the data that we have. Um, and then just closing again, we're really interested, um, you know, on collecting additional data on alternative payment models and value-based payments, uh, looking to start some of that Medicare data, Advantage data collection as well, possibly looking into collect some ERISA funded, so those are the self-funded data, um, um, and really looking to, to establish uh, more consistent matching. Uh, right now, we rely on a lot of demographic elements that we see are kind of declining in use, things like SSN, so we want to make sure that we're able to kind of consistently match across history um, on an ongoing basis, even though if that usage declines. Um, and then towards the future, you know, looking to integrate some of the information that we have here and claims data with other healthcare data sources, uh, clinical data, public health data, and other data sets. I think that's all I have. Yep, thank you. So yeah, um, if you folks have any questions, I'm here, I think. Ron Janista from Health Analytics Office at MedQuest is also here. Uh, so we're, we're open to answering any of your questions if you have any. All right, thank you so much, Sean. Okay, so we are now going to move on to questions. Um, so if you haven't already, please type any questions, comments, or feedback for Sean's presentation into the chat. Um, for the chat, I believe there might be a drop down menu for the two section in the chat box. So make sure that it says um, panelists. I think both of them, both of the drop downs have panelists. Yeah. So please send in your questions. We will wait a couple of minutes. And we also, as Sean had said, we have Ranjini Starr here as well, um, in case there are any other questions. I don't see anything right now, but Sean, I do have a question for you. <laughs> um, okay, I'll save my question. I see a question in the chat now. <laughs> Are you able to see that, Sean? Yeah, so the first question, I'm not sure if I can answer. Um, the, the second one, I, I think Ranjini can jump in here too. So the question is, will it be possible to see how many hospital visits on each island for methamphetamine associated conditions of the last year and whether they have a mental health diagnosis? So as long as the data is contained within our database, I think that's possible. So we do have diagno diagnostic um, fields that we collect uh, so we can see associated mental health and behavioral health conditions over time, as long as they are covered by those insurance plans that we collect data from. Um, uh, so I think it's possible. And then I guess it, the question would come down to how we define some of those like methamphetamine associated conditions and whether or not they can be defined via, via claims criteria, because if it can be, I think that's definitely possible. So, and this is Ranjani, I'll just sort of add to what Sean said, which is it is possible. Um, that said, um, I think you might want to think through the easiest way to get your answer. So there, there are hard ways and easy ways. And at this time, I think um, Sean's presentation kind of clearly laid out, we are focused on a long-term plan to establish a, um, a data analytic platform that will make 
uh, the ability to have all of these data sets in one place and to be able to answer these kind of questions easier. And the team is very hard at work on the planning and preparation for our future. So from a data request perspective, I'm really doing my best to minimize the number of data requests that go directly to um, the APCD team. And I don't know that either the Medicare population or the EUTF population would be what you're targeting for you to get your best sense of methamphetamine associated conditions. So then if you're interested in the Medicaid population, there is a way to submit a data request to Medicaid specifically, and that would be a data poll that you know we could do for you. What would be more easy from my perspective and sort of give you a statewide answer would be to get this data from La Lima since you're not looking at cost specific data and that will give you um, all plans, all payers, a, a full sort of um, accurate state estimate of methamphetamine associated conditions in the state. Hi, uh, Dangalas, just to echo what Ranjini just said, uh, the La Lima billing data might be a resource for that. Um, you have to better define, I would say, what is methamphetamine associated conditions. There are specific codes for um, abuse of meth, dependency of meth, and <clears throat> acute overdose, but it um, sounds like you want to get at more sort of chronic effects. Okay, I, I just got a message in the chat that says that um, you that the attendees in the webinar can't see the question. So I just reposted it into the chat. And I believe that you guys can't see who is talking. So earlier, uh, it was Ranjani Starr. And then just now it was Dr. Dan Glanis. So this is really good to know for our next um, meeting. Um, are there any other questions? Okay, um, Sean, I'm gonna ask you my question now. Um, my question is, um, eventually, do you think that there will be a dashboard for the Hawaii APCD? Yeah, I, I think that's something on our roadmap. Um, maybe Ranjay can jump into here. Um, part of what we're doing our, in our infrastructure uh, planning piece um, is really trying to create, create the capability to do those things on a more routine basis instead of having them more um, ad hoc made. Um, we're looking to kind of centralize all of our data management um, and some of our analytics work to make, to make the data more useful and usable for those type of scenarios. So yeah, I think, I think that's only possible, but. I don't know, Ranj, if you wanted to add anything to that. Yeah, I think the answer is yes. Yeah. All right, awesome. Can't wait for that. Um, I will give another 30 seconds or so for questions and then we will go into a break, five minute break. Okay. All right, looks like there are no more questions. So thank you so much, Sean. And thank you so much, Ranjani as well for being here. Thank you so much. Um, we are now gonna go into a short five minute break and we're gonna transition between speakers. So feel free to stretch, grab some water and be back in five minutes. We'll, be, we'll see you at 1, 137. Thank you. Prevention Systems Branch. He will be presenting data from the Hawaii Poison Center. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Bronstein. Okay, thank you very, very much for inviting me today, Connie. Thank you. I um, want to share my screen, but since from the last speaker, one of the questions raised, I thought I would show uh, something real quick before I begin my formal presentation. 
This is some data from the Hawaii Poison Center for 2019 for methamphetamine poisonings, or exposures rather. There were 23 in 2019. This obviously probably pales to the all claims database, but it does give one a little flavor of what's going on in the community. And this is statewide Hawaii. And you can see the age ranges of the 23 and 19. I do have 2020 data, but it's not complete. The age range was 20 to 29 of the people used it and was the was the largest number followed by 30 to 39 and a party to 49. So curiously, there was a one-year-old who was exposed. The other curious thing, a little factoid, and we haven't really reviewed this in detail, but of the 23 cases in 2019, 20 of the calls came from hospital. So that means these patients were probably very ill and the ones that are not real sick probably either don't call the poison center or don't go to the hospital. Uh, seven of them were intentional suspected suicides, which is not good. And then five of them, not surprising, were intentional abuse. And in this group, there was one death. So just there, so I just point this out as another resource for data. It's like, it doesn't have large numbers, but it is uh, something that could be helpful to folks. So. On uh, typically the poison center data is a barometer of what's going on. So hopefully you all can see my screen. I apologize for diverting, but I thought I would show you some of the information we have, especially since someone asked that particular question. So my name is Dr. Al Bronstein. I'm very pleased to be here today. I'm the branch chief for the uh, Hawaii Department of Health, Emergency Medical Services, the Prevention System, System Branch along with Dan Galanis, who's our branch epidemiologist. Um, so I want to start with a little bit of history of the Hawaii Poison Center. For 40 years, Hawaii had a poison center at Kapiolani Hemans and Children's Hospital. And in the year 2000, the hospital was, an, was unable to support the poison center. And over a period of a year or so, there was a transition process to a new poison center. Poison Center. Capulani used this logo uh, called Mr. Yuck, which is no longer used, in, but it was it was once upon a time heavily used. And the idea with Mr. Yuck, some of you might know, they would print stickers, and the idea was for parents to go through under the sink with their children or places and put the stickers on containers, and that would tell children don't 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 drink or use or touch that container. Unfortunately, that idea did not work. In some cases, actually made children more in, uh, inquisitive. So let's see if I can make my... Let's pause. Why... Can you all see my screen, Connie? Uh, we can see the NPDS case summary. Oh, okay. No, I want to see the... I'm um, stop and restart. Sorry. Sure. Yeah, no worries. Okay, now you can see my screen, right? You see the you see my title slide? Yes. Perfect. Okay. So this is Mr. Yuck, as I mentioned, and this is the current logo and the 800 number. And now hopefully the thing will why is it not? Okay. Now I can't make the slides move. Is the most distressing. Can you try clicking on this slide, Dr. Brownstein? Maybe you're not focused on that window. Oh, you're so smart. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you. I, I thank you for that. You all gotta think I need to go back to school. Okay, so the United States has a poison center system. There are 55 U.S. poison centers, which serve all 50 states. Puerto Rico, the U.S. Virgin Islands, Washington, D.C., plus three Pacific jurisdictions. Some states have no poison center in state and they contract their service out, like Nevada. And some states have multiple poison centers, like California has a four poison centers in a system. Texas being the biggest has six, obviously. So there's 55 centers and they're all connected by the NPDS system, the National Poison Data System. 
Uh, the poison centers have a toll-free 800 number, a 1-800-222-1222 that operates 24-7-365. Poison centers are staffed by medical toxicologists, toxicology nurses, RMDs, pharmacists, and PIPs, poison information providers. The Canadian Poison Center system has started putting an epi in each poison center. All the centers use a standardized electronic medical record system. And the about 60% of the data fields that the centers collect down to product names uh, it, are uploaded to the national point to NPDS approximately every eight minutes. So this is a near real time uh, reporting system using the standardized uh, data set online. We have data since from the year 2000. The system has multiple uses from study and for research to a surveillance. Every year, the association publishes an annual a report. So NPDS and the poison centers also have a strong collaboration with the CDC. This has been active since 2006 as part of this uh, American, the, Toxic, the poison centers have a, have a toxico surveillance team that analyzes the anomalies generated by the surveillance system of NPDS. There are eight toxicologists distributed across the US. The goal of the collaboration is to um, work on public, is to, to, in, to increase collaboration between public health agencies and uh, poison centers. And the data is used to track exposures of public health a significance to augment and to augment public health response activities and many times poison center data will find uh, use in the cdc's emergency operations center um, this is a picture of the pods the laundry detergent pods that caused a lot of problems when they were first introduced here's some examples of uh, the poison center from deep water the, from the oil spill in 2010, Deepwater Horizon, the Fukushima nuclear reactor accident, and Superstorm Sandy. So for the oil spill, the Gulf Coast poison centers received hundreds of calls from people about exposure to various agents. This graph is graphically depicted here. For Fukushima, we got we had a standardized set of FAQs that we developed jointly with CDC that the poison centers use. We track those FAQs in response to questions and experts from Fukushima. Poison centers also come into play with the Superstar, Superstorm Standy, for instance, tracking carbon monoxide. Many times during hurricanes, it's extremely common for people to put their hibachi grill in the kitchen or bring in the generator into the house. And all these instruments uh, produce carbon monoxide. So carbon monoxide exposures will, uh, uh, will increase. Little, to, be, to be more recently, poison centers have been involved tracking chloroquine. This is a graph showing the 2020 chloroquine in the US, comparing it to 18 and 19. And you see the blip here was when there was a lot of publicity about using this drug for COVID-19. This data led to a haunted re release by CDC, a health uh, alert network release. So that's one way poison center data is used. Um, there's also been a lot of discussion of exposures, cleaners and disinfectants. The bottom graph shows is taken from the March uh, MMWR that we published showing a dramatic increase in bleach exposures not returning to baseline in the year 2020. P Hawaii Poison Center data also showed this increase here in the same time period and another one in August. We continue to monitor that. Hand sanitizers have been in the news, especially methanol hand sanitizers containing, which were incorrectly produced with methanol rather than isopropanol or ethanol. 
And this was a report we did the same MMBR uh, in March showing the blip in hand sanitizer exposures. And you see Hawaii, although the numbers are smaller, had a same type of an increase in exposure calls, both in August and in March. So a lot of the things that happened in Hawaii is very similar in most respects to various parts of the country. I'm pleased to report though that Hawaii did not have any methanol hand sanitizer exposures like many of the other poison centers did. In fact, here is an epi curve of uh, the hand, of the methanol containing hand, hand sanitizer exposures from uh, June through actually yesterday showing that we're still getting some calls, but most of the products have been removed from the market after the FDA alert. And one other thing about COVID-19, people do call the poison centers for infectious diseases. And this bottom graph depicts the number of calls by day to the U.S. poison centers, in, uh, including Hawaii, calls about uh, the COVID-19, either information calls asking questions or exposures. And you can see it was a peak here in, like, uh, in March, another peak in July. And I'm kind of starting to see a little trend upwards here now as we're getting into this new time. So Poison Center, my, my point here is that the Poison Center data is a barometer of what's going on in the world. Okay, Hawaii Poison Center. This is the Hawaii Poison Center data from the year 2000. And this, we're, are, we are graphically depicting here the number of calls and divided into the three basic types of calls that the Poison Center data is that Poison Center system uses. The red line are human exposure calls. The black line would be info calls. These have gone down precipitously due to Dr. Google, where people don't call the poison center as much anymore for a drug ID or other questions as much as they used to. And the green and red line are animal exposure calls. So why poison center gets about a 300 a year or so of animal exposures. People are very concerned about of their pets. The decrement in the Hawaii human exposure calls is extremely similar in, in pattern and amount to what we've seen nationally. And part of this is due to Dr. Google and use of the internet. So year to date, 2020, the Hawaii Poison Center has received a total of 59 52 calls. Last year at the same time, year over year, we had 6,400 calls. Um, 5,019 were, were human exposure calls. Last year, there's 54, 11, and 1,435 of the calls, human exposure calls, were from healthcare of facilities. The Poison Center system is one of the few places where a physician can call and speak with a medical toxicologist uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week for a toxicology consult. There are not that many medical toxicologists in the US. So uh, that is the overview. And then let me show you a little snapshot view of, this, of the calls from 2020 year to date. The top three drugs or medications are, would be ibuprofen, acetaminophen, and bleach. And this points to the fact that people get take are exposed to what's commonly available. And if one goes to one of the big box stores, We've all seen the bottles of 1,000 ibuprofen and 1,000 acetaminophen. You know that acetaminophen taken uh, in bulk can cause severe liver damage. Not surprisingly, the calls come predominantly from Oahu, from Honolulu, 68%, with a 13% from Hawaii County, and 11 from Maui, and this doesn't show Kauai, which is about 6%. Most of the calls, 46%, were the reason for the call was unintentional general, we call it, which means people just take it. And you all, if we 
can imagine the the the, the reason for that is that about half of the calls that poison centers receive are about children less than age less than age five. And this has led to the idea that poison centers are just for little children and moms and dads, but actually the bigger problems come in with the older people. So we cover the whole spectrum. In Hawaii this year, so far, almost 17% of the calls have been suicides. We'll talk a little bit more about that. One of the other advantages of poison centers and the toxic and the system is that approximately in Hawaii, for instance, 62% of the calls were managed from whence the call a came, which is usually at home. So poison centers save, save healthcare dollars. 29% uh, of the calls the patient was either in or uh, en route to the emergency department. You see the top age categories, the one-year-olds uh, counted for about 12 and a half, 12.6%, the two-year-olds 10%, but number three in the categorization would be 20 to 29-year-old. And um, so that is sort of a broad brush you want to look at the age distribution, it's really, say, bimodal. You have less than one to five years group, and this accounts for probably about half the calls. And then it starts going up six to 12 to the teen years. 2029 was the next highest, and 30 to 239 through the adult years. There is, if we broke it out, a significant number between 60 to greater than 90 for people that be very extremely vulnerable, adults as they're called. And we have some that are unknown. That's the general poison center distribution or ages. And this is true not only for Hawaii, but for all the other poison centers. The gender of who calls a Hawaii poison center, 51% uh, were female. 47%, these are not the callers, but the exposed rather, excuse me. 51% were females and 48% a male, and which is pretty typical for the overall point of view, but it flips a little for suicides. The exposure route, most exposures are 80% roughly are ingestion, followed by inhalation, and dermal, those are the top three. We have some ocular exposures, some bites and stings, and other places are much smaller amounts. Pretty much what you learn as a toxicologist, people will put anything anywhere. Okay, the management site for the Hawaii Poison Center is mentioned both nationally is about 60, uh, let's see, I wanna go back, I hope I can go back, 62% are from when the call occurred in Hawaii, and about 29% are in the hospital, are en route to the hospital, or the patient was referred 7% by the poison center to the hospital. Caller site, not surprisingly, with half the calls being children, is 67% at home, but this also applies to the suicides and the young adults, the older people, many exposures occur at home. The elderly, for instance, say frequently don't wear their glasses and a lot of pills look alike and they can make mistakes of unintended therapeutic errors. And 29% of the calls originate from healthcare facilities. So we feel like the poison center fills this unmet need for medical toxicology consultation. Exposure substances, we looked at that just a little briefly, but to go in more depth, the number one substance at 3.5% of all exposures, ibuprofen followed by acetaminophen, the adult formulation, adult formulations, we classify them as tablets like say 325 to 500 milligrams of acetaminophen, and then bleach. Hypochlorite bleach is ubiquitous not surprising people get into bleach. Then we have the benzos like the azepam or valium, these are brand name, atypical antipsychotics like aquatiapine, erisperdol, which we use for depression. And then other non-drug substances, the whole potpourri of things. So, and then down here, it would be ethanol, and this will come more into play with the suicides. 
Now the medical outcomes, about 46% are to be no discernible uh, effect, 30% are gonna be minor effect, and 6.8 per three are gonna be moderate, and a, a little over 1% would be major effect. We have a very small amount of the patients who die after calling the poison center. And nationally, the poison database gets between 1,500 to 2,000 fatalities or records. And uh, this is obviously much smaller than some of the other fatality databases. But we must remember that in the calls to the poison centers, the poison center actively intervenes in the patient's care. So I think that's why we get uh, a better outcomes. So I want to talk about a few categories that may be of special interest. Uh, suicides, poison centers do get a significant number of people who ingest medications in an attempt to commit suicide. This year so far, we have 830 people call a poison center with the reason being an intentional suicide last year is a few more. Suicides by counties, once again, Honolulu leads, followed by the Big Island at 15%, of Maui at 11.9%, or 11.8, and Kauai would be 3.1%. So based on population and such, this is not too surprising. The, these are the most, uh, these are the most uh, frequently used drugs and in intentional suicides in Hawaii. Number one being the benzodiazepines, like Ativan or Valium would be trade names, obviously. Acetaminophen by itself, the adult formulation. Again, we have the atypical antipsychotics, and then one gets into ibuprofen. And then number five will be ethanol. What we find from a toxicological perspective that alcohol or ethanol is the releaser. People will imbibe and get inebriated and it will release their inhibitions and where they may have just been thinking about doing something to hurt themselves once they get the ethanol in the system that releases them to take the medications. You notice that in this list of one, two, of top 10 or so, there's no uh, opioids. So that's the, um, that was the intentional suicides. Now we'll switch to opioids. And this is a graph from 2000 showing the number of uh, human exposures to opioids in Hawaii for the poison center data. Obviously these numbers are gonna be different than other data sources, only one data stream. I'm a big fan of attempting to commingle these data streams. As you can see, beginning around the year 2015, opioid exposures start began to decrease, which uh, predates a lot of more recent work. We've seen this before with things like syrup of Ipecac. You may remember parents were advised when they left the hospital to keep a one ounce bottle of a syrup of Ipecac to make the child vomit should they take a poison or what's possible poison. And we, we started to see the decline in those recommendations before the major professional organizations said Ipecac's passe. We don't, we don't vomit anymore. We don't, we don't use syrup of Ipecac anymore. Uh, so this shows the opioid exposure, just the rate, the number. And then I am showing here for the reasons for the opioid exposures. And the, this line is intentional suicides. You can see it's been a marked decrease. So the programming has helped there. So this is not in the top 10 of drugs or 12, it's way down on the list. The green line for opioid ingestions uh, would be unintentional therapeutic errors where people get confused or take their, maybe double their dose or take three times their dose, not intending to hurt themselves, but they just get confused. Frequently happens to me. Then the yellow line is unintentional general, where people just took the opioid and didn't have a specific intent that we know of or were able to understand. The light blue is intentional abuse. 
see it's not really the most frequent use, at least in the poison center data. And the dark blue here is, is unintentional misuse where the correct line. So that's the opioids and being, and then I wanted to show a couple other things. One other thing about the, the um, calls to the poison center for COVID-19, where this is a graph from Hyema of the Hawaii confirmed cases per day. And one can see that if we look at the poison center calls, it tracks very similarly. And now they're starting to increase. This is not to the same scale, but so I, once again, I point out that the poison center is a is a barometer, I believe, of what is going on in the community. We may not have large numbers, but it's a barometer, and things like, for instance, the methamphetamine cases that we have show that they do take a lot of healthcare resources as evidenced by most of them were calls from the hospital. So with that, I wanna say thank you very much for having me. Here's my email, Dr. Galanis's email, and uh, thank you all very, very much. And, and I was pleased to, to be able to present to you today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bronstein. All right, uh, we are now going to move on to questions. So if you haven't already, please type any questions, comments, or feedback that you have for Dr. Bronstein into the chat, and then um, we can read it off from there. Okay, so it looks like we have two questions. There we go. I'm going to send it via the chat so everyone can see it. We actually have three questions. Okay, so the first one is from uh, Dr. Bush. He asks, have cases of nicotine poisoning gone up with vaping and then down with less vaping? Um, there have been some changes. I haven't looked at that. Uh, it looked at that recently, but if you send me your email address, I can send you that data. There have been changes. Awesome, okay. The next question is, do you ever have clusters of methamphetamine poisoning? Poisoning, um, Example, a number of cases in the same geographic point? Once again, I didn't pull that. I'm sure there are that we have seen you know, multiple cases in the same place. And uh, I did not break up the methamphetamine by the island, but that would be getting to that point. But, but, but there are clusters. Got it, okay. And this question is from Nicole. She asks, are the opioid calls broken up by type? Has there been any increases in fentanyl as seen in other places on the mainland? I don't think the fentanyl calls have gone up, but I need to double check that. We do, the products database is identify substances by product and um, we can, identified by the brand name as well as the, the generic code and if I, um, I, I'd have to go and look to give you that answer. Once again, send me an, uh, an email. I'll be glad to send that information. All right, um, the next item is from Tammy Smith. She said, excellent presentation and use of real-time data. What an amazing system. The opioid related calls to the Hawaii Poison Hotline is one of the current items on the Hawaii Opioid um, website, hawaiiopioid.org dashboard. Um, how is this system set up and how is it able to give such good data that is usable? Okay, well, the dashboard project, I'm a, the NPDS system started in 2006 and I'm one of the original progenitors of that system. So I'm, so I'm not biased, but uh, we more, there, we now have the dashboard that I showed you, those methamphetamine shots, and that is a real-time dashboard based off the incoming data from the poison centers uh, in near uh, real time. So it, every time one goes in, one looks in there, the data is current. So the poison case data, we have a product, I didn't talk about the products database, which is about a half a million products divided into a, a hierarchical structure of generic codes. And when a spy, we call them specialists in poison information, those are the nurses on the phones, receives a call, they attempt to identify to the product name. If they can't, then they will 
match it to the type of product by generic code. And the way we do the dashboard is the reason the dashboard is so robust is because the data is constantly coming in and being updated uh, every hour. So uh, we've um, not only in the dashboard system can we do three years at once, we can go back to the full 20 years, but that's only updated once a day. So uh, that's how we design these dashboards. And uh, they're extremely useful. If anybody would like to see how the dashboard works, uh, just give me a yell. Okay. Um, quick question, Dr. Bronstein, um, your contact email address, uh, people are asking for it in the chat. Is it alvin.bronstein at doh.hawaii.gov? Yes, ma'am. Okay, I'm gonna share that with everyone so that they can have that. And Dr. Galanis is here today too. He may have a few comments to, to add. Uh, just want to thank you. Just wanted to echo what Dr. Bronstein said that um, Poison Center it does seem to be a barometer, and that trend he showed, that sort of uh, declining trend in opioids, is also evident for fatalities um, of prescription opioids, as well as uh, presentations to the hospital, starting in about. Looks like we peaked in Hawaii around uh, 2015 or so. They've been going down ever since. All right. Okay, we have another question. This is from Michael Walsh. Uh, the question is, to what extent does your data indicate that there are alcohol and or drug crises among youth at this time? Well, I think I think the idea that the number three age group was 20 to 29 demonstrates that. And uh, we see it in, in younger um, people as well. Um, so the problem is that not all exposures get called to the poison center. And so um, we don't know the exact, but I, I could run alcohol and, and by age, I just didn't do that, but it is significant, I believe. I'm sorry I don't have the exact answers. I just didn't, a lot, I don't want to quote by memory and then say something that's inaccurate. So I'd rather, you know, go to the videotape, so to speak, and look it up. Okay, got it. All right, um, let's see. Dr. Bush, he said, Dr. Glanis, do you have a map of methamphetamine calls similar to the map you have of naloxone rescues? I think Dr. Bush is referring to um, we can we can uh, plot on Oahu anyway the EMS calls that where the medics dispense naloxone. Um, unfortunately, we don't have that same capability in, in context of meth use. It's it's possible with the revamping of our uh, record management system in in EMS that um, we could maybe put that in there. It's just the hesitation there is, um, you know, the medics often do not know what substance is involved with the patient at that time. So uh, I think that's always going to be kind of a gray area. All right. Dr. Bush said, okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Okay, uh, Vicki Taylor asks, was any of the hand sanitizer toxicity listed as a specific name type of hand sanitizers? Um, I mean, please say that again for me. Could sure, be, sure. Be brand name or? Yes, was any of the hand sanitizer toxicity listed as a specific name type of hand sanitizers? We do have, we have about 50 or 60 hand sanitizers in by name. So I would have to look them up um, to be answer that question. I can give you though, if just in, in light of that last question, just a second, let me just do something, Connie, real quick, if you don't mind, this might be helpful to folks. Sure. Um, one second, let me make this up and, let me uh, see if I can share the screen again. And uh, I just did this on the fly. But um, if 
I can get it back now on the fly. These are methamphetamine exposures. Um, would it show before? See, that's the trouble when you do stuff on the fly. Would it show before the bulk of them were actually on Oahu? And uh, they were in color before, but I don't know what happened to my map. Well, let's do one thing real quick. Come in and come out. Let's see. Well, it's not wanting to cooperate, but anyway, before this is this highlighted. So we do have some information by county where the methamphetamine exposures are. And I don't know why my system has decided to fail me. But that's what happened. That's why you don't, oh, here we go. That's why you don't do live TV, I think. Okay, here you go. Here we got the Big Island. And if I roll over, there's eight cases in the Big Island, 12. There were 23 methamphetamine member. There were 12 and eight here. And actually this is uh, Maui. There were three. So there's the bulk of the cases. So that gives some idea of, uh, where the methamphetamine cases are. We have to really look at it because it's probably it's probably skewed a little bit by rates. We have to know the rate with populations to really say. Anyway, we can do this like for all the drugs, all the products that are all the exposures with the poison database now. Okay, that's what I wanted to show you. Thank you. I'll stop sharing here, maybe this thing. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Okay, um, any last minute questions? We'll hold on for maybe 30 seconds and then we will start wrapping up. I've really liked your description of the Poison Center as a barometer. And I think you had some things on your slides about the COVID impact, but I was wondering if there's anything else that you saw that seemed significant or you know surprising. Um. The, I think the bleach, the, the disinfectants and the bleach exposures have increased and, and uh, we did not have, we, we, we looked for parenteral IV or IV bleach exposures, but we didn't have any after some comments were made about giving it IV. But I think uh, the ability to track the methanol hand sanitizers was extremely helpful to FDA to see where they were located. And like I say, I was gratified that I could see that Hawaii didn't have any. So that's the good news. All right. Oh, go ahead, Dr. Bronstein, sorry. I was gonna say, it's gonna be very interesting to see this peak number three that I alluded to. It looks like it's starting to trend up for the, for the, uh, for the calls to poison centers. If that isn't, if that goes hand in hand with either with uh, increased cases, as the case count increases, hopefully it doesn't. Are people just having more, uh, having more questions? There's a very interesting area for research that there's been a few some papers published that people sometimes start calling about things before the event happens, like earthquakes. They will go to Google more about earthquakes be before there is one. So it's an interesting phenomena there. Okay, all right. I think we are good. Um, okay, so thank you so much, Dr. Bronstein and Dr. Glanis for being here today. We appreciate both of you taking the time to present and be here with us. Thank you. Um, thank you. Okay, we are now going to move on to our closing remarks. I know we're a bit early right now, but that's okay. It's better to be, you know, early than finish later. So, um, all right. So we wanted to briefly mention um, a little bit about the SCOW uh, membership and consent form that we had sent out on uh, Monday, October 19th. And Bobby, sorry, could you um, share the link into the chat as well? Uh, from the PDF, yeah. And we will share the link into the chat. 
Um, so this consent form was sent out on Monday, October 19th to past and present SEOW members. Um, so the UHEPI team is updating, uh, we're, we are updating our SEOW membership list to ensure that our list is up to date. Um, we also would like to obtain your consent to include your name, title, organization, and your membership years as well on public materials, including, but not limited to reports, websites, um, such as the SPF PFS website, the PHAC SEOW website, and also other materials relating to the Hawaii SEOW to acknowledge um, everyone's involvement. Uh, we would also like to obtain a media consent as well. So as you all, most of you probably know, um, our past uh, SUW meetings were recorded um, using the meeting format. So we were able to kind of see like um, the attendees who attended the meeting, which is why we need to ask for consent before we make the videos public. But now that we're using this uh, webinar format, we actually don't um, need the consent any anymore, which is great. However, we have a lot of past recordings that we would like to make public to share the knowledge that was given during those presentations. So uh, this consent form um, has all of that in it and we will share, yeah, Bobby has shared the link in the chat. So it's a media consent form um, and also a membership form in one. So if you did not receive the email, back in October and you are a past or present SUW member, then we deeply, deeply apologize. We wanted to mention this form at this meeting today to catch anyone that we may have missed from that email. So if you have not done so yet, um, please fill out the form. Again, the link is in the chat um, and we will be closing that form by 4 p.m. today. So we have about an hour and a half. So you have time to fill it out if you haven't done so yet. Um, I think that is about it. We're going to finish earlier today, which is fine. Um, is there any questions at all before we adjourn for today? Okay, I'm going to conclude here. So that concludes our last SUW quarterly meeting for 2020. And, oh, sorry about that. That was my computer. Uh, please stay safe, everyone. And we will see you all in 2021. Have a safe and happy holiday season. Bobby and I will stay on just in case there are any other remaining questions or so. But thank you again to our presenters. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.